All right. I believe I have a PowerPoint. We'll see if I, I do this as well as the how well they trained the ones in the Philippines to do this. So I was asked a, uh, a, about a month ago, I was going to go talk to somebody, and they were asking about building or maintaining their relationship with God. And I felt like that was a, a good topic that we could have this morning. So all of us need to develop a relationship with God. But where can we start? With many people, it starts with, is God real? It's a very popular belief out there that at this time, God is not real. He was something that was made up and that everything was not planned out. The heavens declare the glory of God and the expanse proclaim his handiwork, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasures. So something we have to ask ourselves is, is there evidence? What, what do we see that's around us? This says that everything that we can see explains God, shows that he is somebody that created all of these things. And by his power, he's given us the, the evidence that we need that we do have somebody that's out there. We have something that created this stuff. It's by intelligent design. It didn't happen by accident. Was this an accident? Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed me from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. God made all things, and he did it by himself. O Lord, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power, because you created all things, and for your will, they are and were created. God made these things for himself, and he made it so that he, would, he could be pleased by those things that are made. We are part of those things that God created. And by all of these things, we do have an evidence that there is somebody out there that's done all these things for us. We are not an accident. We are here for a purpose. We were created to do the will of God. There we go. So God spoke and all things were created. Genesis 1.3 and God said, let there be light, and there was light. If you're going to come to God, if you're going to learn about him, you have to know something about what he's done and how he's done it. How did he create all things? God created by speaking. When did the light appear? After he said. Second Peter 3 five through seven. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. God has had a plan. He's had this plan from the beginning. We are part of this plan, and God wants us to be involved in his plan so that we can 
teach those things to others and bring them the knowledge of God. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I learned this class a long time ago in, in Vaughn's class. And most of the time, the focus was on the last part. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. This is an important part. But it was much later when I understood there's a really important part before that. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. That God exists. If you don't believe that, you can't move forward. You must believe that he is. Can you please God without having faith in him? No. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. We have to believe that God exists and that he created all of these things and that he has a plan to reward those that diligently seek him. So why did God create all things? This should come, come to us as a question. Why did he do all these things? God saw that everything he made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning was the first day. When God created everything, he looked at it and he said, that's very good. What was created on the sixth day? You and I, through Adam and Eve. God created man, and he looked at them and they said, that's very good. Now, as we go through, we don't have time to study each part of the God's plan, but man started off good, and then they shortly fell. But the plan began with them being very good. Why did God create all things? Matthew 25, 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why did God create all things? He wanted to have a kingdom. And he prepared that from the foundation of the world for everyone that was going to do his will. For everyone that diligently sought after him. That was part of the plan. And that was why God created all things. Psalms 132, 13 and 14. For the Lord hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. God's plan the reason he did this was so that he would have a house. He would have a home. A home and a family. So that he could give this kingdom to his family and that he could be here with them. He wants us to be here. How many of you want to be in this kingdom? I know I do. That's why we're here. We want to build this relationship with God so that we can find out what it is he's looking for. Why did God create us? Yes, this is part of all things. I thought I'd single it out a little bit. Do you ever hear the question, why are we here? I've always found Isaiah 45, 18 answers this fairly clearly. Why are we here? For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it, 
He cre created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Why are we here? God created this whole universe, this whole planet, for us. So that we could inhabit this planet, live in here, not just at this time, but specifically during the thousand years and eternal age. That's why God created all of this. This wasn't some accident. God did this on purpose. Luke 12, 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God wants us to be there. He's not going to choose us on our skin color. He's not going to choose us on our looks, thankfully. He's going to choose us on our minds, on what we choose to do with our life, on how we choose to search after him and to do his will. How are you? How am I searching after God? Am I? Are you? He wants to give us this kingdom, but it's not going to be for everyone. It's available to everyone, but not everyone is going to choose to be there. Verse Revelation 21, 7. This is who, who it's going to be for. He who overcomes will inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Those who overcome the challenges of this life, have you experienced any challenges? I believe I have. I think each one of us have. God tells us in other areas that his ways are equal. Not any one of us have a test that's easier or harder than anyone else's. Each test is, is designed specifically for us. And anyone that overcomes will inherit all things. I definitely want to be there. I hope I can overcome. I need your help to overcome it, just as I will try to help each of us, each of you, to overcome. Why did God create us? He wants us to inherit all things. God's plan was centered on his son. This is Paul speaking in 1 Corinthians. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. God had this plan from the beginning, and it was centered on. Jesus was his focal point. Everything depended on him. The reason it depended on him is without him, our sins would not be forgiven. Christ died for our sins. We have all sinned. We all need Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth, giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Each of us has this opportunity because of what Jesus did. Each of us can, can overcome, be forgiven our faults, and be raised up at that last day to enter into his kingdom that God wants to give to each and every one of us. 4, John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. One thing that helps us come closer to God is understanding his plan, understanding that he had this from the beginning. This isn't something that's going along and God says, oh, I think I'll do this next. No, all of this was planned out. He wants to give us eternal life, but there's qualifications. You must believe in Jesus. 
I didn't have this verse in there, but John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that, that, that they might know you, God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ who he has sent. You have to know who God is and who Jesus is in order to obtain these promises. So what is God hoping for, or what is he looking for in us? Again, this takes effort. This isn't something that he has given without qualifications. He asks us in Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Probably should have had that part highlighted also. And his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. He wants us to first in our life, not second, not third. Job is not first. Family is not first. God is first. In that, all these other things shall be added. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. And if you study that out, that's all the things that pertain to this life shall be added unto you. What else is he looking for? Mark 12, 30 and 31. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. The second is like, namely this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. He wants us to love him first, and love our neighbors also. Love our neighbors as ourselves. It takes both of those things. Love God with everything you have and love your neighbor. What do you guys want more than anything else? You know, for me, and I believe for you, eternal life, life in the kingdom. Love your neighbor as yourself. If that's what you want more than anything else, what do you want for your neighbor? You want them to have eternal life. This is usually used as a closing verse. This one's in the middle. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. I wanted to follow this with the verse that I, it was either Titus or, or Cohen brought up, which was, perfect love casteth out fear. When you're a child, why do you do what your parents ask you to do? Because what happens if you don't? Typically, it's the spanking, right? Fear God and keep his commandments. Why should we fear God? For all have sinned. So, those of us who are older, why do you try to do what your parents ask now? Do you fear them? Do you fear the spanking? No? Typically, it's because at that point, you love them. You want to do things for them. That's how perfect love casteth out fear. Because at those points, you shouldn't be doing those things that are disappointing. And in this case, disappointing to God. That's how perfect love casteth out fear. If you're doing those things that are right in your life, you have no need to fear. Fear God. Keep his commandments. If you're wanting to develop this relationship with God, you have to learn how to obey God's commandments. 1 Samuel 15, 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. God requires both, doesn't he? 
He requires obedience first and if, when you fail, he asks that you do sacrifice, that you sacrifice your desires and put in place of that God's desires. To obey is better than sacrifice. Why is that better? If you obey, there's no need for sacrifice. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. God's looking for faith. We read in Hebrews 11, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. So we have to have faith in God. We have to believe that he's going to do those things that he's told us he will. That he's going to give us the kingdom. That he's going to give us an eternal life here on this earth forever. The just shall live by faith. Why do you tend to obey? It's because your faith tells you, if I do, I will receive this gift. So these are some of the things. This is not exhaustive by any means. These are some of the things that God is looking for in us. There we go. So what do we have so far? God created all things for a purpose. Emphasis may be on God created. Two. The earth was made to be lived in, and after a time, to be God's dwelling place forever. Three, we were created to please God and join him in his kingdom on earth. Four, God is looking for those that have trust in him and obey him, faith and works. Might add another one in there that what we know is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. If you know these things, you can begin to have, you can begin your journey on your relationship with God. What's next? Introductions have been made. A relationship has started. What's next? Train our minds. Philippians 4, 8 and 9. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, Think on these things. If we find that uh, God is somebody that we want to have in our life, then we need to find out all those things that are true, all the things that are honest about him, everything that is pure, and think on those things. Train our minds to be going after God in all that he is searching for. Verse 9, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. As we're thinking on these things, you have to also apply it to your life. One of the other teenagers, I can't remember which one, talked about that you can't just learn. You also have to give time to do. Paul told us here, Everything that he did, do that also. And we've been going through the life of Paul for a couple of years, sporadically. And did he do things for God? Yeah. Has he gone through more than most of us? Yeah. Sacrificed, journeyed, worked for God. Those things which you have learned, received, and heard, and seen in me, do. Are we asked to do the same things? 
Yeah, in our way, God wants each one of us to do those things that are pleasing to him. Increase in works and knowledge. Colossians 1.10 that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. I think most people, we've kind of been trained this way. You go to school, you go to college, you go to the university, you learn first, and then after you leave those areas, then you start to do. That's not how it's done. You do as you're learning. You don't learn it all before you start doing. As you learn it, you begin to do it at that same time. I don't know why that was a thought that was crossing my mind, but like I think it does. It is taught in this world. Learn first, then do. No? Learn and do at the same time. The things that you're learning to do, if you apply that to your life, then you're going to build on that, building those things together, increase in works and knowledge. This is all to build your relationship with God. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on the candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. How many of you learned the song when you were growing up, This Little Light of Mine? Okay, how many of you thought it went, uh, uh, hide it under a bush, oh no. I definitely thought that. It wasn't until I was older, reading this verse, hide it, hide it under a bushel. No. Yeah. But the, the idea here stays the same. When you know what to do, if you do it, you are a light. You want to shine your light so that by your good works, that people shall see, they will glorify God. How will they glorify God? They will start emulating God's works. They will start doing the things that God has asked them to do. Shine your light. God is waiting for you. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. God has been from ever, from forever to forever. No beginning, no end. What he's waiting on is you. And he has forever to do it. It's us who don't have forever. We have to choose him today. Joshua once said, choose you today who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve Jehovah. Choose you today who you will serve. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some men count slowness, but is long-suffering to us, not purposing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everyone. There's not any person alive that he does not want in the kingdom. <laughs> So is everyone going to be in the kingdom? No. Sometimes I wish I, I, that this verse would include the very next word because it says, not purposing that any should perish, 
but that all should come to repentance. But, followed with, the day of the Lord will come. Not everyone is going to choose him. You have to decide, do you want to choose him? Do you want to have this relationship with God that he says to you, come, blessed of my father, enter into the kingdom prepared for you as a bride adorned for her husband? If you want that, then you want your relationship with God and you want it to be a good one. So, in conclusion, Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. And I stopped underlining things and highlighting things because I started seeing I would have to underline the whole verse. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful who promised. And let us consider one another to provoke to love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What this takes is we have to hold on to our faith, hold on to the profession or the works of our faith. Don't falter. Don't let it go. Those things that you have seen and heard of me do. Let us consider one another. Is considering a work? Is this something you actively have to do? And provoke. We've oftentimes in this day and age used that word as a negative thing. But provoking just means you're trying to bring out or draw out something from them. In this case, provoke one another to love and good works. Each one of us has this job. Try to get those around us to improve on their love and good works. Encourage them to show, to show their light in love and good works. In verse 25, what we're doing here today. Forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. It's a good thing to see everyone here. It's a good thing to know that there's those that are out on the internet watching and listening. Knowing that there are people all over this world who are trying to do God's will as much as we can, provoke each one of them to love and good works. If you do these things, you have started on your journey to knowing who God is and having a relationship with him. Thank you. Number 262, the love of God. Number 262.
thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the record that you have left for us, that we might be able to read that and find out who you were and who you are, so that we might do those things that you have asked of those, those who are your followers, that they might choose to do the things that are right and be an example to those that are around him, to help each one of us to shine our light and to find our role in your life for us. We thank you for the gift of your son, that through his death on the cross, we have an opportunity to have our sins forgiven. That we also might be raised up at that day when you send your son back to this earth, and that we might be with him when his feet touch Mount Olives. We ask that we all might be here on that day when you come to this earth, that we might see that holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God, that and see you when you will be here, and that you might say, you are our God, and we are your children. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me,